Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is a companion video. What are companion videos? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take your questions. And the way you get a question on the show or in a companion video like this one is to simply go down into the description of this video and click on the tip link or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll be getting your question right on a show if, of course, we deem it appropriate to use on our show. And, of course, you'll be supporting the channel at the same time and all of us involved with the John Campia Show. Thank you guys so very very much for your support. And uh, yeah, this is it. Just saw a few hours earlier tonight. This is being recorded on Tuesday, November the 16th. The Spider-Man trailer dropped a little while ago. I'm not going to lie to you. Totally surprised we didn't see Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire in it. But we kind of did. Like, there's, It's up on my Twitter right now, but there's a video shot from the Brazil version of the trailer where you literally see lizard flying through the air and spider-man's way over there and he's flying through the air at something that's not there and then all of a sudden boom you see him get punched in the face by nothing that's there so clearly another spider-man was digitally removed but anyway we're going to talk about that on the john campus show at length tomorrow still an awesome trailer but i'm very very shocked they didn't show us toby and andrew makes me think there's going to be a third trailer I might be wrong about that, but it makes me think there's going to be a third trailer. Anyway, right now, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the questions that you guys had sent in. So let's not waste any time and get over to it. And we're going to start getting caught up here with a question from Dangerous D who writes, Hey, John, I saw in your last video you were worried that the MCU is showing their B characters. I was surprised, to be honest. It's a good thing that they're showing all their characters, whether they're B, C, or X characters. I'm not saying that they would work, but uh, but minded them use them, um, DC, but minded them use them, DC, uh, do the same thing as MCU. I know you told several times not all the characters would work or not work on film or TV, I know. I'm saying give it a chance. DC has a library of incredible characters and millions of fans should see as a fan should see. And as a fan, I'm begging for this. Thanks. See, I get, I get the sentiment dangerous D I do. I get the sentiment, but here's the thing. It doesn't matter what characters you have in the archive there. You can have a character called, uh, Alexander, the ass pimple. That's a, 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 the, a very unknown uh, DC or, or Marvel, whatever, a combat character, very unknown, very deep cut character, uh, Alexander the Ass Pimple. Um, but if you write the right script for him, and if you have the right director on it with the right vision, and you capture the right story, and you do it a certain way, it's going to work. Or it won't. Like, we often talk about this in terms of villains. It just having it doesn't matter how good your comic book villain is. That doesn't mean it's going to be good in the, on a movie screen, right? We talk about Doctor Doom all the time. Doctor Doom is one of the greatest comic book villains of all time, and they've tried and failed with Doctor Doom like three times. He's the greatest comic book, but so it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. All that really is relevant is: do you have enough characters there that are recognizable and people have some connection to? And that's why Marvel built on Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, Hulk, and then they started peppering some, some other little things. And when I said I was worried about Marvel using their B-Squad, I don't mind them bringing in new characters. It's just that I worry a little bit, not panicking, just a little concerned, that I wonder how the general audience is going to respond without your big heavy hitters anymore. I mean, Thor is still around. And we got a Spider-Man com movie coming out, but even Shang-Chi, which is awesome, it didn't get a lot of attention. Eternals, which was very cr cr split critically, but I thought was a pretty good movie, but it didn't get a lot of attention. And I'm worried now that we are heading into what I would call the B squad, the B squad of Marvel characters, you know, whether it's Ms. Marvel or Moon Knight. And I'm not saying they're not awesome characters. Don't get mad at me. I'm not saying they're not awesome characters, but as far as like the average person have, having ever heard of them, well, most people never read a single issue of She-Hulk. Most people never read a single issue of Ms. Marvel. Most people never read a single issue of Moon Knight. Most people never read a single issue of um, 
uh, oh, I forget uh, one of the new ones that are coming out at any rate. So, I, and I'm just a little bit worried and concerned that I don't know how the audience will respond to it. I'm not saying that they're not great characters to explore. I'm just saying without having your Captain Americas there to shore everything up, without having your Iron Mans there to shore everything up, I'm just a little curious and yeah, maybe even a little bit worried about how the audience will respond to what is essentially the B squad now for Marvel, but we will see. We will see. All right. Thanks for sending that in, man. Next up, we've got Tony Rodriguez writes one of two. Okay. Mocap pick guess slash second end credit for Spidey three or Dr. Strange two. So something happens in either movie that causes a power slash energy ripple that reaches far out into the galaxy. We zoom in on a shining silver glimmer and we zoom in on the silver surfer uh, head. He turns around. How's that sound? Uh, think that could happen in either in either. No, I don't. No, I don't think so. First of all, there's really no connection at all between Silver Surfer and Spider-Man. Like, if it was Guardians of the Galaxy. See, I could see a Guardians of the Galaxy coming across Silver Surfer. I could see the Eternals on their starship coming across Silver Surfer. I don't know that something in the mystical realm like what we're getting in Spider-Man No Way Home would be something that would involve Silver Surfer. I just don't see that. Uh, that doesn't seem like a natural fit or a natural connection to me. So I like that you're thinking outside the box, Tony. I like that you're thinking outside the box, but I don't think that's what they're going to do. But hey, anything is possible, dude. All right, next up. Matt McClure writes, Congrats on the success and new full uh, full time additions. Thank you so much, man. I'm having a good time. Also, keeping it all the way 100. I loved Red Notice. Oh, good to hear, man. Specifically, that it was awesome without any political or social heavy he uh, heavy handedness. Uh, it was a fun time with good acting. I loved it. Yeah, we've been hearing a lot from people that they hated it. Like a lot of people didn't like the movie. Uh, we've been hearing from a lot, but I'm also hearing from a couple of people like yourself, Matt, saying that you did enjoy it. And that's the beautiful thing about movies, man. It's all subjective. What some people like, you may not. What some people hate, you may enjoy. And that's the great thing about movies. So thanks for sharing your take on it, Matt. All right, next up, Willow writes, you said that you consider the theatrical cut of Lord of the Rings to be the definitive version. For me personally, yes, because I always consider the theatrical release the definitive version of a movie. Even if a director's cut or an extended cut is even better, I still consider that's the movie that got released. That's the true movie, at least to me. That's how I interpret it. Anyway, so are Saruman and Wormtongue dead or are they still stuck up in the tower? Do deleted scenes count as something that happened in the story? Well, I mean, there's no real answer to that, Will. I mean, because remember, this is when I say that's the definitive version, I'm not saying that that instantly means anything that happened in director's cuts, or whatever, are um, never happened. I, I'm not suggesting that at all. It's just the take on the movie, the presentation of the movie. How was this story presented? I'm not saying, oh, we saw this happen in the extended cut that didn't show it in the regular cut. I'm not saying that should then be discounted. That couldn't have happened in, in the other scenes. I'm just saying that, you know, when I think of the story, when I think of, you know, that director telling that tale, I think of the theatrical version. So what did happen, what didn't happen, I mean, that's a whole ball of wax for another time, I suppose. But it, I, I don't really know how to address that otherwise. Anyway, thanks for writing that in, Willow. Okay, next up, we got uh, Raffle, who writes, Hey, John. Uh, since Microsoft had their celebration event and revealed a number of surprises, I was mostly excited about the reveal of the Halo TV series. What are your thoughts on the future of this series and will they make a movie anytime soon? Thanks. Um, yeah, I got excited when I heard that the Halo teaser dropped and then I went to go see it and it was really nothing. All it was is a close up of some hands and then, hello, Master Chief. And okay, uh, I could have made that teaser trailer at any rate listen i know this isn't going to be popular to say but i feel like this is coming like six years too late i i just feel like this is coming six years too late maybe even a decade too late like this there was a time when halo was like the video game right and back in the day 
Peter Jackson was going to produce a Halo movie. Neil Blomkamp, who directed District 9, was going to direct, but he had never directed anything before. This is before District 9. This is going back a ways. And they tried, and they couldn't get it off the ground. And so now it's kind of coming in the form of a TV series. I have no expectations. I have none. I'm not saying I'm expecting it to be bad. I'm saying I have no expectations whatsoever. I really don't think it's going to be made into a movie. I think the opportunity and the time for it to be made into a movie, again, maybe if they were lucky, was as, as short as six years ago, but really was probably more of a decade or more ago. So I don't expect to see it as a movie. But hey, any new series coming out, I hope is great. So let's see what comes with it. All right. Next up, uh, Dr. Nova writes, I have a Star Wars theory for you. Okay. Star Wars would not be as popular as it was if not for the prequels. Oh, I disagree with that completely. Uh, it would be something that your generation liked, but others didn't care about. But then the prequels sparked the fandom again. No, no, I disagree with that. And the reason I disagree with that is this. There's a reason that the Phantom Menace broke all the opening weekend box office records at the time. That's because Star Wars was still extremely popular. It was still extremely popular. There's a reason. We talk about it in my documentary. Uh, by the way, plug, plug, plug. My documentary, Movie Trailers, A Love Story. Go and find it on Amazon right now and go give it a watch. Anyway, uh, but one of the things we talk about in Movie Trailers, A Love Story was that the Phantom Menace trailer was it is the most important movie trailer ever made. It became the first time ever that people were literally going and buying tickets for movies just to go in and see the tra the Star Wars show. Because remember, this is before YouTube. So they were going just to buy movie tickets just to go in and see the trailer and then leaving. People were going to see buying tickets to meet Joe Black just to turn around and leave. And that's because Star Wars was like already at that time, the most popular franchise in the world. So no, the prequels did not reignite anything. The love was there. That's why people were buying tickets in droves to go to movie theaters just to watch a trailer because Star Wars was most still at that time, the most popular, as popular as it had ever been, the most popular movie franchise in the world. So no. The prequels did not reignite anything. Now, now listen, there were, there was a younger audience that maybe had never seen the original Star Wars and maybe those prequels for them got them going on their journey. But at some point they would have seen the original Star Wars movies anyway, the better movies. Um, but yeah, look, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. Like, I think it's great. Like whatever brings somebody into Star Wars fandom is good by me. I may hate the prequels, but if the prequels introduced Bobby over there into the world of Star Wars fandom, awesome. If Jim over there loves the prequels, awesome. I hate them, but that's cool. That's fine. That's just me. I love that you love them. You know what I mean? So, but, but no, I, they did not reignite some dying fandom at the time. I think the ticket sales people going out in droves to see the trailers that is proof enough that star wars was already massively popular at the time and so that's that's just kind of my take on it all right thanks for sharing your thoughts on that dr nova appreciate that man all right next up orange grove 55 writes not to sound uh <laughs> not to sound conspiratorial uh, but the silence on Disney Plus Day just reeks of a studio without a leader. Uh, transitional period. I think Kennedy's contract was renewed three more years recently, but it just feels off to me big time. Yeah, and we talked about that on the John Campus show earlier today. Uh, listen, I am personally quite surprised that they re-upped her deal. But at the same time, we shouldn't be too terribly surprised. Under her leadership as the president of Lucasfilm, they've put out five motion pictures. One of them is the number one domestic box office film of all time with Star Wars The Force Awakens. Three of the remaining ones made over a billion dollars each. And then there's one solo that underperformed. But one of them, the biggest domestic box office film of all time, more than Endgame. The others, all billion dollar films. 
Under her leadership, they developed and launched Mandalorian Season 1 and Mandalorian Season 2. And Bob Chapek has nothing but a hard-on for Disney+. Plus. And what's Kathleen Kennedy delivering to him? She's delivering him Book of Boba Fett, Mandalorian Season 3. Uh, she's delivering uh, The Acolyte. She's delivering Ahsoka Tano. She's delivering Andor. I mean... Yeah, I got a laundry list is for the reasons why I think she should move on. But I I get why they extended her. I do. But yeah, I'm with you, man. I mean, it's just the whole thing. It just I think that is an organization right now in complete disarray. But you know, let's cross our fingers and hope for the best and hope things get turned around there. All right, next up. Sam Fisher writes. Uh, what do you think of the Moon Knight costume, except for the hood and the cape, looking just like what Boris Karloff wore when he played Imhotep in 1932? I would love if the suit made a Moon Knight look like a mummy, cool or tacky. Um, I don't know. It's funny because I remember having a discussion about what, because there are different, you know, minor, some major iterations of the Moon Knight costume that have been in the comic books. And the question of, which one should they go with for Disney Plus series? Look, we didn't get a good look at much in the in the little sizzle they showed. Uh, I don't know why they didn't show more. But I did kind of like what I saw. But again, it just wasn't enough for me to form a real opinion on that just yet. But it will be interesting, Sam, to see what the final full thing is going to look like. All right. Next up, we go to Sam Fisher again, who also writes, To be honest, I don't like Chris Nolan. Outside of the Dark Knight trilogy, I didn't like Dunkirk. Ooh, I love Dunkirk. Uh, and Inception was so hyped that I was underwhelmed. I really love Inception. Once I actually saw it, I'm excited for this Oppenheimer movie, but only because of the subject matter and Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. Uh, I mean, you yeah, listen, that's the beautiful thing about film, the subjectivity of it. But like to me, man, whether you're talking about um, Insomnia, which... I personally think is my favorite movie of Christopher Nolan. I, I think that movie's a masterpiece that nobody talks about. Then obviously his Dark Knight trilogy, uh, The Prestige, Inception, uh, Interstellar. Uh, you know, I, I thought Dunkirk was brilliant. I thought Dunkirk was absolutely brilliant. So, but hey, like any art, it's not going to be for everybody. And if Christopher Nolan's stylings don't quite you know, hit you the same way they hit a lot of us. That's perfectly cool, man. That's great. Doesn't work for you. All I can say is it really does work for me an awful lot. Uh, you know, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Tenet. I like Tenet. I'm not the biggest fan of it, but aside from that, it's just been win, 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 win for me when it comes to Christopher Nolan. All right. Next up, Sam Fisher also writes, I just finished a rewatch um, of one of my favorite shows, Numbers. I never did watch that, uh, but I noticed something. The show has a regular cast of nine, but one or two characters are always rotated out of every episode. Maybe a character is on an assignment or at a conference or on a fishing trip. Uh, why? Did they not have enough to pay nine actors for every episode? Could the writers not juggle writing nine main characters an episode? Do you know why a show would do something like this? Can you explain it to me? I think really you summed it up. Listen, if you've got a show with like nine main characters, you're not always going to have something for them to do, right? Like there's not always going to be something for every single one of those characters to do. So what do you do? Do you force them into an episode? Do you shoehorn them into an episode, even though there's no reason for them to be there, according to the story that week? Well, why would you do that, right? So why don't you kill two birds with one stone? Streamline it. Stick to the characters that are required for the story that week. And then give somebody a week off and you work that into the contract. So yeah, especially with a series, like it's different for three's company where there's like three main characters, but sometimes you're going to get shows like that with an awful lot of main characters. Like I remember community once in a while, there would be a cast member, not there. If you don't need them for that week, don't force them in there if it's unnecessary. So that's kind of my guess on that. All right. Thanks for writing that in Sam. Next up. Sam also writes another costuming idea, but for fantastic four. Once Fantastic Four get their suits, I would love if they wore different shades of blue like Ben wears navy blue, Reed wears wears royal blue, Sue wears baby blue, and Johnny wears cayenne. Thoughts? Do you think it matters? Do you care? Uh, no, I, I, I don't care at all. Now, look, I can look at 
costumes in movies and think that looks good or that looks bad, but ultimately it doesn't affect the movie to me whatsoever. A great example of that to me is Black Lightning, the CW show that uh, is no longer running, but I love that show. I thought the show was great. It was one of the most ass stupid costumes ever in the history of superhero television. The Black Lightning costume that they manifested, um, you know, in in the show live action show looked terrible. Absolutely horrendous. Did it affect my enjoyment of the show one single bit? Not at all. If it was the greatest superhero costume I'd ever seen, would it have made the show any better? Not at all. I mean, as as long as something isn't like, I'm not saying, so John, what are you saying? Do you think you could have Superman and he's just wearing a pair of diapers and a baby's bib and it would be fine? I mean, no, now that, that's an extreme thing. But uh, honestly, for the most part, I don't care what a costume looks like. Yeah, for a second I can go, ooh, that looks cool. Or, oh, that looks bad. But then you just get back to the story and the story is all that matters. The, the acting is all that matters. The dialogue is all that matters. I mean, that's the thing that really makes it so, eh. And quite frankly, if you're going to, to me, if you're going to have a team in different costumes, then make the costumes different. Don't just have different shades of blue. Like have them all in their own individual things. Have them look completely different. Or just put them in a uniform. I mean, like kind of one or the other. But even if they don't, to me, doesn't really make a difference. All right. Thanks for asking, Sam. That's a really interesting topic to bring up. All right. Plot Twisties writes, hey, John and crew, one of six. Okay, buckle in. Dude, I'm really worried. I think you hit the nail on the head when you speculated that things at Lucasfilm were probably a hot mess. I also agree with you that Kathleen Kennedy shoulders most of the responsibility. Well, she is the person in charge. I almost think... She believes her duties as a studio head relegate her to a salesperson, a pitch man per se, little regard anymore to the creative process, concerning herself with announcing juicy projects with hot directors to entice the fans and then patting herself on the back for a job well done. But the lack of follow through has bit her in the ass a lot. In normal times, this wouldn't bother me. Eventually, the higher-ups would take notice and sack her. But these aren't normal times, and right now, I really don't trust the decisions being made by the suits above Kathleen Kennedy at Disney. I think we all agree Favreau would be an incredible replacement. Uh, and now, now may, wait on that, too. Like, You know what? Let's get back to the Favreau thing in a second, because not necessarily. Not necessarily. All right. But do we really trust Bob Chapek to make that decision? Or whatever bean-counting banker he's delegated that responsibility to. We're just finally seeing the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel, a pandemic that has cost Disney quite a bit of money. Do we have any faith in Chapek's regime to choose a successor for Kathleen Kennedy on creative merit? Or do you feel like I do that they're more likely to install a money guy more concerned with the bottom line rather than quality control. Uh, could it be better to stay with the devil? You know, my guy, please tell me this doesn't look as bad as I think it does. All right, plot twisties. Thank you so much for so passionately sharing your thoughts on that. First, let me just touch on the side topic there about John Favreau. We don't know John Favreau would be a great choice. As far as I understand, John Favreau has zero days of experience of being an, a studio executive. And it is a different job being a student, as we are seeing from Kathleen Kennedy, who is maybe the best producer in the history of Hollywood. If not, she's in the top three and certainly in that discussion. The greatest filmmaker of all time, Steven Spielberg, says she's the greatest producer ever. I take his word for it. Anyway, but we're finding out that being a producer is different than being the executive of a studio. They're two different jobs. And just because you're good at one does not mean you'll be good at the other. That's uh, quite honestly, people get mad at me for it, but I'm sorry. I laugh when I hear people say, make Dave Filoni the head of Lucasfilm. What does Dave Filoni know about being an executive? Nothing. He's made cartoons up till this point. Some fan favorite cartoons. Nonetheless, I'm a big fan of Rebels. Um, but what on earth? Just because you like Clone Wars, you think he should be the executive of a company? I've never understood that. Now, the only reason I am open to the idea of John Favreau is because when you watch 
the making of the Mandalorian series, you see that Jon Favreau has really kind of taken taken on an executive kind of role over the show. He's not in there every day directing the episodes, but what he does is he assembles his directors. He shepherds his directors, and then he makes sure they understand the creative direction of where they're going and then sends out the directors to go and make it happen. He's kind of taken on the role of an executive. But that is a small bit of experience when it comes to that sort of thing. So I, I don't know necessarily. I'm just saying that if John Favreau was selected, I would feel pretty comfortable with it. But I don't think automatically it means he's going to do a great job. Just because you're good at one thing doesn't mean you're going to be good at the other. As far as the creative side, some people are saying that Kathleen Kennedy gets too involved with the creative side. That she rushes ahead, like you were saying, to announce hot director names and announce these projects before doing the work of finding out if she and a set of filmmakers or directors are actually on the same page together yet. And we went over on the John Campion show earlier today, all these in her short tenure. Because Amer- like, seriously, uh, Kevin Feige has been running Marvel for over like 12 years now, right? In that entire time, while there have been some very quiet behind the scenes, oh, this director has come on, but we made no announcements about it because we weren't 100% locked in yet. Oh, and now that's, but then we realized this wasn't going to work. We moved them off. We moved somebody in, but there were no public announcements. There was nothing like that. I can only think of one example under Kevin Feige's tenure where it was a, woo, everybody, we're doing this movie with this great director. And then it fell apart later. And that was with Edgar Wright on Ant-Man. One time in like 12 years. Kathleen Kennedy, in her tenure at Lucasfilm, we of course had the Josh Trank thing. Came, went. We had the Colin Trevorrow thing. Colin Trevorrow is coming to direct the third Star Wars movie. Woo! And then very unceremoniously, yeah, we parted ways creative differences. Why didn't you decide, figure out in advance if you were going to have creative differences or not before hiring him on and announcing it to the world? You had the famous Lord and Miller situation. You hired on Lord and Miller to direct Solo, and then three quarters of the way through shooting the movie, yeah, we have creative differences. We have, we, we're not on the same page. Why didn't you figure that out? Do you see a pattern happening here? Do you see a pattern happening here? Even with Gareth, uh, Gareth uh, Edwards, he finished Rogue One, kind of, but then we find out that he was kind of pulled off it. He was locked out of the editing room. They brought in another director to come in to kind of polish things up and fish, fish things off because, again, Kathleen Kennedy... Not getting on the same page with the directors. Now we're finding out Patty Jenkins. They announced Patty Jenkins, all this fanfare is going to do Rogue Squadron. Woo! And now we're finding out creative differences. Do you see the pattern? Do you see the pattern? Then Obi-Wan. There's like, oh yeah, we've got the Obi-Wan show. We're ready to go. Blah, blah, blah. And then we find out they had to basically scrap everything and restart from scratch again because suddenly now Kathleen Kennedy decided, ah, maybe the script's not where I wanted it to be. You couldn't have figured that out beforehand? Do you see the pattern here? And that's concerning. But again, the bean counters at Disney, they're looking at a different set of criteria. She's had a lot of success. Mandalorian is swept the world. Season two swept it even more. The Force Awakens is the number one box office domestically of all time. Three of the other four remaining films all made over a billion dollars. She's got this big, long lineup of upcoming stuff on Disney Plus that Disney is very excited about. So, if you're an executive there, I get it. I get why why they gave her an extension. I wouldn't have, but I can understand why they did. And now all that you and I can do is cheer for her. Wave the Kathleen Kennedy flag and say, listen, you're there for at least three more years. I hope you do a great job. I hope we do a great job. I mean, that that's that's kind of all that's left to do plot twisties. Anyway, thanks for sharing your thoughts on that, man. Really appreciate that, dude. All right, next up. Rachel Remney writes, Hey, John, I was curious to, as to how long you personally see Bob Chapek being Disney CEO. Could you realistically see Disney bringing in a new CEO in the next year or two to replace Chapek due to how unpopular he and the changes slash decisions he's made are? I I think it's too early to call. I mean, listen, things at that level are different than, say, things on a YouTube channel's level. 
Like, uh, here's an example. AMC Theaters, which is not as big as Disney, but AMC Theaters, when they're implementing something, I mean, they have a saying at AMC. It's an old saying, but they use it a lot. It's like their mantra at AMC Theaters. Crawl, walk, run. Essentially, what that means is we take everything really slowly. Really slowly. And... Like, here's an example of how slowly they go. When I was still at AMC Theaters, they were doing all their research and prepping their AMC A-list membership. It didn't roll out for three and a half, four years until after that. They take things very, very slow. And on these big corporate levels, uh, these big corporate levels, they very rarely do anything quickly. So regardless of how bad of a job I think Bob Chapek has done so far, the reality is they're going to give it a what they would consider a reasonable amount of time to see if it works out or not. And a reasonable amount of time is probably going to be three years minimum. And, and to be honest, look, as much as I have trashed Bob Chapek, I'm also careful to say this. We got to recognize that he became CEO of Disney under ridiculously impossible circumstances. He became CEO of Disney in the midst of a global pandemic that literally shut down all their theme parks across the world, that shut down all their movie production, that shut down all the movie theaters so even the movies they had in the can couldn't go out to the theaters, they couldn't deliver their product. It was under these circumstances, a global financial crisis brought on by a global pandemic. Those were the circumstances under which Bob Chapek became CEO. And I think as negative as I have been towards Chapek, and I stand by my assessment of Bob Chapek, I think he's made some really dumb decisions. But that being said, I will still be the first person to say, we, you got to give him more of a chance. You got to give him more of a chance. Because it's not an easy job, and he stepped into it under the most impossible of circumstances. So, no, I don't see... I don't see a CEO change happening in the next year or two, maybe in the next three or four, but I don't see a change happening in the next year or two. And, and maybe honestly, there shouldn't be one. I think you got to give it a chance to play out and uh, we'll see what happens again. Like I'm telling people, you should wave the Kathleen Kennedy flag and, and cheer her on right now to, because she's going to be there for at least three more years. I will wave the Bob Chapek flag. I mean, I'll still criticize him when I think he makes dumb decisions, but I will cheer for him. I will hope he succeeds. I will hope he makes great decisions. I will hope he'll take the mistakes he's made and learn from them and then move forward. So count me as a team, team Chapek, because I want him to succeed. I want him to do a good job, but I will always criticize when I think he's not, he's not doing it. So uh, there's that. Anyway, thanks for writing that in Rachel. All right, next up Zion writes. Black Panther production has been shut down until January. Oh, yeah, I heard about this. Due to Letitia's injury, a new CDC guidelines prevents Letitia from going back to the U.S. without being vaccinated. Letitia is strongly against the vaccine. What will they do, especially if her role is huge? This is an interesting problem. I don't. For those of you who haven't read about this, this is a very interesting problem. So apparently Letitia Wright, who plays Shuri, uh, 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 T'Challa's sister, I think she's great in Black Panther. I think she's wonderful in it. Anyway, she got injured, she had to fly home to London. But now there are these new guidelines that you can only fly back into the States if you are a citizen or if you have been vaccinated. It, there's more fine points to that, but basically you got to be a citizen, a permanent resident, or you've got to be vaccinated. You got to show proof of vaccination. Letitia Wright is not a citizen of the United States, nor do I believe she is a green card holder. And she refuses to get vaccinated. She's an anti-vaxxer or, you know, an anti-science person, as, as I like to say. But, and, and that's totally her right. That's her right to choose to do that if she wants. But she can't fly back into the States right now. She's not allowed to fly back. Black Panther is in production in the States. If she can't come back, what do you do? Do you freeze production over one actor in a movie? I don't think so. Unless it's like the main star of the movie, which apparently she's not. You can't hold up 
a movie, you're literally losing hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. Literally losing hundreds upon hundreds of thousand dollars a day. So what are they going to do? I don't know. Do you replace her? Maybe you got no choice at this point. I mean, if she can't be, if she can't be there to do the job, you got to replace her with somebody who can't. I mean, I don't know. It's a sticky situation, but it's going to be very, very interesting to see how that works out, Zion. All right, next up, we got Glenn who writes, Hey, John, uh, Venom 2 will come out next week here in Australia, which means Sony will put out three Marvel movies in three months. Um, who does that if they don't have to come out before Doctor Strange 2? I fully expect Spider-Man and villains to go back to Sony after Doctor Strange 2. Yeah, I, it's either going to be after Spider-Man No Way Home or after Doctor Strange 2. But I mean, you just don't know, right? Like, look, I've said for a long time, I believe that the events of No Way Home are going to spark you know, the, be the impetus that, that moves Spider-Man over to the Sony. Now, whether that actually happens in No Way Home or maybe Doctor Strange 2, I don't know. But listen, just because I said, I think that's what's going to happen. We don't know that's what's going to happen. And honestly, right now, I think releasing three Sony movies in three months could actually be really cool right now. I mean, not under normal circumstances, not in 2019, but right now that could actually be a lot of fun, Glenn. So I would, I would just count it as a blessing right now. If I was a film fan in Australia, I would just count it as a blessing. All right. And I'm just glad you guys are going to have a chance to see it now, Glenn. Thanks for writing in. All right. Anonymous viewer writes, a lot of people say you can't blame Kathleen Kennedy for the bad Star Wars sequels because she is talented and has an impressive resume. I haven't heard anybody say that. I haven't heard anybody say you can't blame Kathleen Kennedy for bad Star Wars sequels. I haven't heard a single person say that, but maybe you have. I'm just saying I haven't. Anyway, because she's talented and has an impressive resume, both J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson also have impressive resumes as well. So who's to blame? Well, I mean, look, whenever you have a project that involves thousands and thousands and thousands of people, there's plenty of blame to go around. But the place credit and blame both start with is with who's in charge. That's where usually we go to with the credit first. But that also means that's where you got to go with the blame first. How much credit does Kevin Feige get? He gets all the credit. But if things start to go south at the MCU, he's also going to take the blame. And rightfully so. So yeah, when you're the director in the chair... And by the way, J.J. Abrams directed a magnificent Star Wars film in The Force Awakens. I, I love that movie. I flat out love that movie. I think it's the best Star Wars movie that's not one of the original three. I think it's the best Star Wars anything that's not one of the original three Star Wars movies. I really do. I like it that much. And then Last Jedi, I liked less. And then Rise of Skywalker, I hated. But be that as it may. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of blame to be given to the directors. Absolutely. But at the end of the day... If you're going to ask who is the buck stops here person that has to shoulder the responsibility and, and take accountability for something, it's always the person at the top. Because look, I, I, I was mentioning this before when I was running things at AMC theaters and I was running things at Collider, I got a lot of credit for how big and successful movie talk was rightfully. So I designed that show. I'm the one who put that show together. I'm the one who, who recruited everybody and all the incredibly talented people that were on it. I'm the one who selected them. I'm the one who put them in the positions, blah, blah, blah. Yay. I get to take credit. Woo. But guess what? We also did some things that didn't work. We had shows that we tried that didn't take off. We had projects that we thought would be great. And sputtered and failed and quickly had to be shut down. I'm responsible for those too. You know, that ultimately when a show doesn't work and we had put man hours and, and resources and time and energy into getting that, that we could have spent on other things, but we spent that time, energy, resources, money, and everything on that thing. And it doesn't work. That's on me. That's on me. I'll I take the credit when things go great. I take the blame when they don't. That's the job. That's the job when you're in charge. So there's a lot of blame to go around, Anonymous. But the buck stops here person is the head of the studio. Sure, there's a lot of blame to be given to the directors of the bad movies. Yeah, but 
The person in charge of the whole enterprise, that's the buck stops here person, at least to me. All right, Mike C writes, over under 10% Deadpool shows up in No Way Home. I'm I'm gonna say almost, I'm not gonna say zero. I'll say it's closer to one to 2%. I'm so well, well under 10%. All right, uh, Cree Channel writes, John, okay, so hear me out. I have a random theory about a big surprise in No Way Home. What if one of the surprises is Robert Downey Jr.? We actually talked about that on the John Campus show earlier today. What if Spider-Man uh, messing with Strange's spells brings Toby and Andrew in, but also brings Iron Man back? Uh, you have said he will return. Yeah, we were again, we were talking about this on the John Campus show earlier today. Yeah, listen, I have said from day one, from the moment that Tony said, and I am Iron Man, snap. And from the moment he said that, I said, oh, he'll be back. Maybe not next year, maybe not maybe not this year, maybe not next year, maybe not in three years, but he'll be back, right? When you understand his connection to Spider-Man, I think that's a possibility. Not likely. It, it, it is unlikely. But a possibility? Sure, man. I, I totally see that as a possibility, Cree Channel. I totally do. All right, next up, Russell Amador writes, Hey, John, with all the hype building up to the trailer's release, uh, when would you say was the last time we fans were highly anticipating a trailer of this magnitude? Infinity War, Endgame, The Batman, let me know your thoughts. You know, I, I think there's a couple of elements at play with that. I'm going to say this is the most I think people have been excited for a trailer since Endgame. And I say that and not because it's Spider-Man No Way Home, that's certainly a big part, but also because of the particular circumstances we're under, and that's the pandemic. I mean, this is the first real big movie that everybody's been looking forward to that's been coming out since the pandemic. I mean, there have been big ones, right? Like A Fast Nine, like James Bond. These are big, but not like an event blockbuster movie like this. Shang-Chi was a character nobody had ever heard about. Eternals were characters nobody had ever heard about. Black Widow has been a, a supporting character in the MCU up until that point. And they, they finally did do her movie after we already knew she died and it was a prequel movie, right? So I think this is the first one that's like that. And I think that's just amplified the excitement. I'm not taking anything away from the movie itself. I'm just saying I think that has played a part of it. So, yeah, I will say with maybe the exception of the Rise of Skywalker trailers, uh, which no matter how much I hated the movie, we're all super excited about the trailers. With maybe the exception of that, which was pre-pandemic, though, I'd say, yeah, this is probably the most excited we've been since either Rise of Skywalker or Endgame. Uh, that, that's how I would assess it at any rate. Great question, Russell. All right, next up. Tom Gillard writes, regarding going to the movies alone, somebody, a couple of people have written in recently saying, hey, I like to go to the movies alone sometime. Is that weird? I'm like, hell no, that's not weird. That's not weird at all. You like going to the movies and no one's available right now? Why should you deprive yourself of being able to go and watch a good movie just because nobody can go with you? If you're in the mood for a hamburger from McDonald's, you're going to go, oh, but I can't go get that hamburger because I don't have anybody to go with me. No, no, you go. You totally go. Anyway, regarding going to the movies alone, I prefer going to the big blockbusters with friends, as do I. They're great when they're shared experiences. Uh, but for the Oscar bait slash indie movies, I prefer going alone. For those I go to the theater, I buy an expensive drink, and I sit and feel snobby and special. I love the way you described that, Tom. Well said. Yeah, listen, I agree. When it comes to the big blockbuster movies, I, I prefer... I always prefer to go to the movies with somebody. I mean, movies are at their best when they're shared experiences, but I have no problems going alone, but I particularly want to make sure I'm trying to go with somebody if it's the big, the big blockbuster one. So I I'm actually right on the same page with you, Tom. I really am. All right. Thanks for sharing that, man. Uh, Danny Rojas, Danny Rojas, Danny, Danny Rojas, football is life. Uh, hey, John. I hope everything is well. Everything is well. Thank you. I mainly listen to your show on the Apple podcast app. Thank you so much for that. Do you plan on making a subscription for ad-free listening? Football is life. Football is life. Um, by the way, that scene where he accidentally kills the dog is still one of the funniest things I've seen on TV in a while. Anyway, no, I'm not planning on doing a subscription service for Apple podcast. I, um, it's honestly too much hassle and Apple wants too much of a cut. And honestly, 
Like while there are ads on my podcast, there are fewer ads on my podcast than if you're watching television, right? Like there are more ad breaks if you're watching YouTube TV, TV or Hulu or whatever than there are on my podcast. So, um, yeah, no, I, I'm not doing that. I appreciate you asking, Danny, and thank you so much for being a, a listener of my podcast. But uh, no, I won't be doing the subscription thing for the podcast. At least, at least not now. That, that's not in the planning stages right now. Who knows? Maybe a good opportunity will come around at some point. But right now, I'm gonna, just going to keep things the way they are. But keep your eyes open, and thank you for the suggestion, man. I appreciate it, Danny. Danny Rojas. Anyway, uh, Baloo writes, Mr. Campia, your thoughts on the best acting on best acting, Ryan Reynolds in Buried, Henry Cavill in Blood Creek, Sylvester Stallone in Copland are, are, are my picks of their best acting roles. Love to hear your opinions. Uh, first of all, I agree with almost all that. I think Stallone's performance in Rocky 1 might even be better than his performance in Copland. And by the way, I know a lot of people have never seen Copland. It's great. It's really great. If you want to see, if you want to remind yourself how good of an actor Sylvester Stallone is like not playing Rocky watch Copland. Um, but absolutely Ryan Reynolds, best performance is buried. And I told Ryan Reynolds this, I, I met up with Ryan Reynolds in Vegas. Um, I'm going to say six or seven years ago. And I remember all I wanted to talk to him about was buried. And I remember saying to him, like you deserve an Academy Award nomination for this. And I wholeheartedly believe that. He deserved an Academy Award nomination for that movie. He was phenomenal in it. He's the only guy on screen the entire movie. There's never another actor on screen the entire movie. And he carries it. It's unbelievable. If you guys want to see just how good Ryan Reynolds can be as an actor, two movies I would really suggest. One is definitely maybe... I mean, he's got tons of movies I love, but if you want to see how good he is of an actor, definitely maybe, but absolutely watch Buried. Uh, I mean, it's just completely there. All right, thanks for writing that in, Blue. All right, next up, uh, Shiv Patel writes, I know I'm late, but we just attended a Halloween event and one of the guests was wearing one of the most non-accurate costumes ever. He was dressed as Batman and he stood side by side with his parents. Am I overthinking this? Still funny, man. Yeah, huh? Something's wrong with this picture here. Batman should not be with his parents. They dead. I mean, that's that's pretty funny, Shiv. Thanks for sharing that. I would love to see a picture of that. I would love to see a picture of a Batman standing beside his parents. That would be actually be pretty funny. Thanks for sharing that, dude. All right. Last question of the night comes to us from Tevin C, who writes, Hey, John, uh, we are just hours away from the Trailer 2 event. And of course, that was a couple of hours ago now. Um, if we are wrong and Andrew and Toby aren't in the movie... What are the chances that the villains see the identity of the new Peter Parker on TV the same way Venom did? Also, big surprise, Mysterio. So no trace or hint of Mysterio in the trailer. And they already gave us the answer to the thing. It's like a lot of people are saying, how come Dr. Octopus was looking at this Peter who looks nothing like his Peter and saying, hello, Peter. Well, this new trailer gave away the answer to that because the mask was on. And as soon as he took the mask off, Doc Ock said, you're not Peter Parker, right? So they kind of revealed that part there. So obviously, though, Tevin, you wrote that in before the trailer dropped, but now we know the answer to that. And we are going to talk an awful lot about the new Spider-Man trailer on the John Campy Show tomorrow morning. I hope you guys will come and join us for that. Please do. And listen, guys, big thank you to all of you guys who sent in these questions. Number one, because you give us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us here at the John Campus Show so appreciate the fact that you guys choose to support the content you like watching. So thank you guys so much for that. All right, everybody. Do the four main things. Stay smart. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. And please take care of the people around you. That'll do it for me for now, guys. My name is John Campion. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.